Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, go to the website svos.org. Now our guest is Marie Cameron, oil painter and mixed media assemblage artist. Her work often involves the ephemeral of life and it always tells a story. And she has quite an affinity for the secret meaning of flowers. So welcome, Marie. Hello, Sally, thank you for having me. Oh, you're quite welcome. So you paint such beautiful, large paintings with such intricate detail. Tell us a little bit about how you became inspired to create this art. Well, I'm very moved by how everything around us is, is very passing and fleeting, and I find that beauty is even made more strong by that fleeting nature, and I try mm -hmm. to be in that moment and feel it and capture it, reach out to it as it does to me. Beautiful. So what, tell us a little bit about your background and how that might influence what you've done. Well, I was born in New York City, but I grew up in Nova Scotia, and I lived in an area of beautiful orchards and crumbling ocean um, cliffs near the ocean. So mm -hmm. It was the Bay of Fundy with the highest tides in the world. In the Bay of Fundy? In yeah. Canada? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I didn't have any art training in school at all, but I lived in a very creative family. In fact, my whole um, ancestry has been filled with embroiderers and shipwrights and uh, my mother could do anything from move a wall to upholster a sofa and they were both my mother and my grandmother were amateur painters so mm -hmm. I just grew up in that milieu and there was never you know any other option in my mind but to be a painter. So that's what you grew up to and then did you end up going to school to yes. study art? I studied I had uh, my BFA at Mount Allison University in, in Sackville, New Brunswick in Canada and there I minored in uh, photography and sculpture and I majored in painting. Oh, very nice. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about how your career started as an emerging artist. What is it like in Canada? Well, in Canada they offer a lot of grants and I was actually awarded a very prestigious one. It was the Canada Council Explorations Grant and it's awarded to artists who are emerging or are changing their discipline. And so I had purchased a beautiful church when I was Oh, there it is. This is one of those halcyon days. So this church was built in very early, 1877, and it was Methodist, but then it was floated along the Bay of Funday to Morden, where it became Roman Catholic. And I wanted to do a series of paintings that would depict that epic journey. So it actually floated on the water on purpose, and they mm -hmm. were transporting it from one place to another? Yeah. In fact, the name of the church was called Stella Maris, which means Star of the Sea, which was very appropriate. Oh, very nice. And so tell us how that developed. How did you propose, make the proposal, and what was the grant process like? Oh, it was great. Well, I really just followed my passion with the building and the history, and I studied, and I, pr I put together a series of... of um, images that I thought would be interesting mm -hmm. and I, I talked about how what that meant to the community and it was really important for me as a Nova Scotian to to delve into the history of where I was right. from. And you actually owned the building. Yeah. And it's a beautiful church. It was uh, a little gothic one by the sea mm -hmm. and um, in fact I think we have a painting here that's uh, the mussel shells. Oh, the one behind you with yes. the cross. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that one. Well, Morden is a, is a site where the Acadians were um, fleeing the expulsion of, eight, of 1777, and many of them perished at this site in Morden, and the whole winter they had nothing but mussels to eat. So when they left, there were 300 in the initial group, and then 36 come spring, but there was a hill of mussels that was left, oh, wow. and it was incorporated into one of the churches at the base of the mountain. Um, so mussels became a symbol of Morden, and it mm -hmm. became a symbol of Nova Scotia for me too as well. And so this painting has the, the cross from the church covered with barnacles and seaweed and the oh. mussels in behind. Yeah, so really taking your surroundings and painting and applying detail, is, it's amazing. It looks almost like a photograph, but you know it's not because of the way you've designed the painting. It's very nice work, and it's huge. What's fun about it too is something you see sort of horizontally, you, you pull it up vertically and it becomes very iconic. Right. And I like to use that technique a lot. Yeah, to create a story mm -hmm. with the paintings that you create. 
Well, a lot of your images have stories behind them, and you really put a lot of ideas into the images that you paint. Mm -hmm. And you brought some images of another series of paintings that have a history and a story behind them. Absolutely. When so I was, why don't we take a look at some of those? Oh, fabulous. So we have, um, when I lived in Nova Scotia and work, was working on the church, I needed to fund the restoration of that building. And I took a job as a, as a senior designer at Siegel Pewter in Nova Scotia. And while I was living there and working in a Malagash, I lived in this little one-bedroom cottage. And mm -hmm. the history is that this woman named Odessa had raised five children all on her own in this little cottage. In one so, room. Yes. And when she passed away, uh, my landlord had bought it. And when I was living there, he was started ripping up the floor. And he discovered seven layers of linoleum. Oh, wow. And I was just in awe because it just explosion of graphic pattern. And, and I got my X-Acto knife, and I started cutting out these little pieces. So what I was impressed by, it was like, it was like a. Tell us about this one. It was from the 1920s. So I had seven of these, and I thought, this is a decade, a slice out of each decade of her life. So I made these little vignettes of her imagined life. So this one has um, the, the baby things, the innocence of, of her youth with the blocks and the butterfly and the rubber ducky. And what I love about the linoleum is that it's, it's a natural fiber. Um, it's actually um, resin from the tree and, from, oh. and linseed oil. So it's a perfect backdrop for oil painting anyway. This Very one nice. is the, from the 30s, and I've got um, some diaper pins uh, fighting with the, the high heel shoes and the lipstick for different interests going on. And I, I just love how the images, uh, the oil is sort of translucent over the graphic of the linoleum. And it's full of like patina and texture that you just can't make up. So right. using a found object, you've, you've got that to start with. It's fabulous. Excellent. Then this one. Most of the things I made up of her story from knowing what it was like to grow up in Nova Scotia, this one I had found that revolver, that Colt, in the eaves of a shed that was being torn down in her backyard. And along with it, I found a little uh, note that was written in graphite full of spelling mistakes. It was a <laughs> bank robbery note. A bank thought, robbery. Yeah, <laughs> thought, Ooh. But then I thought, oh, she did have five kids. So <laughs> that's probably what happened there. Yeah. So you think the kids wrote the note and were I'm playing hoping. with it? I'm <laughs> hoping that's what <laughs> happened. But that's... Uh, that's my Odessa's kitchen floors. Oh, those yep. are beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And so, how big are those? Would They're you five say? by seven. They're very petite Inches. little pieces. Yes. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. you could say <laughs> five by seven feet, and I wouldn't be surprised at the sizes of paintings you do. I go monumental and miniature. Yeah. yeah. So, you've done paintings, and you work with oil painting. Tell us a little bit about um, the canvases, how you get them, and the. Sure. Well, my. I do a lot of my own stretching of the canvases, um, and my oil paintings are straightforward, you know, just brush painting um, from images that I either see in life or I'm working from photographs that I've taken in my studio. Um, and then I do also assemblage pieces, which are entirely different. Right. So why don't we talk a little bit about assemblage and what that means? What is it for people who don't know that sure. word? Sure. What is assemblage? Well, assemblage is the uh, art of putting things together, found objects, created objects, manipulated. So what I have is a, a base where I, um, I can paint, but I can also fix objects to them. Mm -hmm. And it, there's the elements of collage. It's whatever you want to put on there, really. OK. So and you have a very specific technique that you call florilegia. Yes. Why don't you tell us about that? I would love to. So my florilegia, am I looking at? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to show a, an image of one of them. And you can talk a little Perfect. bit about that and some of the tools that you... Great. Well, the, the idea with florilegia, it's a Latin term that means a gathering of flowers. And it's um, the gathering of flowers is, it's also considered an anthology of, of, of writing. So what I like to do with mine is I have this Victorian... What is this one about? This one in particular. Well, I start with the Victorian meaning of flowers, and each flower has a specific meaning. So this one is the hyacinth, and there's an amazing story um, about the Greek hyacinth, who was the lover of Apollo, and the western god of the wind, Zephyrus, was jealous, and it, he's said to have thrown a discus or blown it off course and killed Zephyrus. I'm um, killed, um, sorry. Hyacinth. Hyacinth. So this painting is really about that story, and you have the tears of Apollo coming down, and Ovid even said it was Apollo's tears that turned the hyacinth blue. 
there's, um, and I, in this image, I've collected di different periods. So I've got Greek keys running in the background. I have um, images from um, an, a, 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 it's a beautiful Greek bowl, and it has a picture of, of um, Zephyrus and Hyacinth on it. And I've used that image in the golden discus that I repeat throughout the painting as a repetition of motif. Very nice. And now you're going to give us a demonstration what? of what, how you build these I would love beautiful to. pieces. So what I generally start off with is a, um, I start off with a frame that I make myself. I line it with a board here. And what's really important about this board, I'm going to cover it with canvas, but it gives me something I can nail into and be a very stable surface. So here I have one where it, it has the canvas that I've stretched and primed. So, and there's a little window in here too, which is really fun. Because what I do with this window is I have these wonderful collection of magic lantern slides. And they're really early slides that are made from the 1850s to the 1950s. And I collect the botanical ones. So um, I put them in here and I illuminate them from behind with light. And it makes for a floral illumination. And my whole hope for these floralesia is that they will um, illuminate the secret meaning of the flower through many different layers. I would like periods from the past. I would like to have contemporary associations. Very loose and fluid. Very nice. So this is actually the interior working of one of these pieces. I have my little magic lantern slides like this. And they go into this piece here. I mount them securely and I'm going to find my light here. I've got this little fun contraption here, which has a switch on it, and it hangs in there. And from the other side, you can see the, the switch, the, um, the magic lantern slide is a, like a little window. So in the window is a flower? Yeah, that's the, the whole starting point of these pieces. Here, I have another one that I'm going to start. I'm going to I'll show you the back. This is one of my oblivion that we'll sh look at later. What I do is I line them with copper, and I can show you how I do that. If you oh, like. excellent, yeah. There we go. So I've got this piece here. And what, what's wonderful about copper, it's very flexible. It ha can take a great patina, depending on the chemicals or just exposure to the elements. And I fit it in here. I use industrial strength glue. And that allows me to hide the unsightly mass that goes on in the interior. Right, when you cut the canvas and fold it in there. Yeah, all the staples and glue parts, so it's, it'll become very clean and pretty. So what my process is, is I have this prime surface, and then I start layering on. So one thing I love to do is I like to have the Latin name for the flower down below. And one of the ways to do that is to transfer from the paper. So I use a transfer medium, which is here. And what I do is I just brush this on horizontally, vertically, and diagonally, and I let that dry completely. When it's dry, I can take this area here, which is a wet piece, and I can peel this just right off, and I will end up with a piece. Well, I should show you better. So it's like that. And you can rub this off, and it will come. Usually, you can see how that's peeling off there. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, what's great is it gives you this piece, which I love here, and this is prickly rose for wild rose. So I'm going to just go ahead and glue that on. Okay, great. So you can use the same medium, which is nice. I'm going to open that up, squirt some on there, and layering that back on and forth. It's really an all-purpose kind of acrylic gel medium. And we have this guy. And it really provides an access point and a bit of, you know, these are inspired from the, the, the Dutch um, masters in the 17th century who did the beautiful vanitas, which talk about uh, the fleeting nature of, of humanity and how everything we do in our material world is really, you know, not very important and you should repent and you should live the moment appropriately. And so that's one thing that influences these. Another one is the beautiful scientific illustrations, botanical illustrations. And that's what this refers to, the Latin name of the flower. 
and then you cover that over. And that's on there as the first layer. But I have many, many layers that I like to do. Right, what would come next? The next thing, I would look at building up my surface. So with my wild rose piece, I'm thinking the, the meaning of the wild rose is simplicity. And I love this, I found this wonderful embroidery that is, I think of as very traditional and very simple right. and from a very pure time. And I could put it on like this, but that's very, uh, you kind of want to transform it a little bit more. So right. by turning it over on the back, all of a sudden you have this really textured, interesting element. And I love the loose threads. I love the way this curves over and will direct your eye to the image. So what I would do with that one is I would just go ahead and really saturate it all with glue and pull it all over there. I would spread that out really fully. And I would have that come on all the way. And then once I get it all over there, I would take the same acrylic medium that I have here and I'll just fully coat that all over. So that it's saturated and shiny. Yeah, you shiny want it to and really be part of, well, the shine doesn't, I don't actually like the shine, but it gives me a base that will seal it, which is important because right. the, the final element I will do will be oil and I can't have the oil rotting the material that I use. So another element that I found that I really loved is uh, simplicity sewing patterns. There and I think go. of that as being very charming and, and uh, of a simple time too. So I could put it like this, but the text would be very horizontal and it would compete with this. So I want to do something that'll be a little more, kind of make you work for it a little bit. Your eye would see it more as an abstract element that will be suggestive without, without um, pulling your eye away too much. And that will go right on like that as well. Fully, 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 fully. And this is be all a surface that I can paint on fully and transform completely. Some of it may be obliterated, some of it will be kept. Now what else I like to do is I'm, I scour eBay and antique shops and I, I have a studio full of little objects, which I love. So I have this one, which is a wild rose. Oh, that's beautiful. But it's too beautiful. It's too ornate for right. this idea of simplicity. So I would look at this and say, oh, hmm, maybe another time. But what I love about these, I found these two, the little stamens of the rose are like just like this. And it refers to the sewing that theme I've got on here. So I will put these on. I might arrange it in a pattern that looks like the rose because repetition of motif with variation is a very key element in almost all art. And then what I do after that, say I've got it all primed and I'm ready to, with my acrylic medium and I'm ready to go on to oil, I have to find my inspiration. So I usually use my own photographs. This one I took in Nova Scotia of a wild rose. I'll use that. But I like this magazine image too. It's got a necklace of, of rose petals. I think that's a very charming idea. And I have this rose here, one of my foundling things, and I would just rip off those petals and I would end up probably using a, like an industrial strength glue and wire and go along would you do that after you're done painting or after you've painted a layer on well, you know, the design, do you think? I think I would wait because I would want to get my rose in place because that's going to be a very key element. And a lot of these things I can work into layer into the process after. Now these take a long time because right. the thinking is actually the most important part. Once I find the meaning of the flower, I have to really let it sort of gestate in my mind about where I want to go with it, how each little element I put reflects that meaning, or does it take it away from it? So in the end, I'd like to show you one of my completed pieces. This is the one that we just seen up on screen. And it has this beautiful uh, aluminum backing that I had designed. What I like about it, it has a little switch that I can just turn on and off from the back. And then you've got the window, the illumination into the, the secret soul of the flower. And what I've done is I've hung objects in behind that you can see in the shadow of the, of oh. the image. And the magic lantern screen is a hyacinth? It is. Inside there? It so each one is the flower that is represented of the painting? It's too? a turn. I've got different, I've got the Greek 1490 BC. I've got like the uh, turn of the century hyacinth here. I've got um, little contemporary issues. You know, the cropping is a very uh, contemporary kind of thing. 
as well as the reuse, repurposing of historical images. Right. So it's very, they're very fun, they're very playful. And I like the as association to be very loose. So you could come to it and see different things over time. Very nice. Well, you have some other images of other completed oh. Florilegia paintings. Why don't we take a look at those and you can tell us some of the stories of those as well. I would well. just love to. This one here is called Happy Marriage. And it's in a private collection. And the, the flower is the peony. And the Victorian meaning of the peony is happy marriage. It also uh, has different connotations of shame, which is interesting too. So what I've done in this one is I've taken a pattern from a Japanese kimono and I've used that peony as almost wallpaper in the background. And I have the buds coming up like the yin yang, which is the really dealing with the duality of the feminine masculine principle in the marriage. And you can see that there's a little uh, element of a bride and groom. That came from a German alarm clock antique that was no longer in use. So the bride and groom are in this frozen embrace. And, and the other that's, and that's a piece for assemblage that you stuck on Yeah, there I've screwed that on. Three dimensional. Yeah, I use glue up. and screws and they're on there forever. I also have little gold rings littered all about. And they almost look like little blisters. So there's this kind of little bit of an edgy a connotation to that as well. This one is called Mature Elegance. And it was an interesting, um, it's the pomegranate flowers, Mature Elegance. It was an interesting concept to try to think how to portray that. And I went with um, a fecund image of a bursting pomegranate going to seed and spreading seeds. And that's why the grenade is there too. It also, Granada comes from the word pomegranate uh -huh. and it's full of seeds and it's spilling forth. So with that, I've done like a whole life cycle. I've done a pregnant belly. I've done, um, there is uh, actually the lips with a pomegranate in between. In ancient Persia, they would do that to have sustenance in the afterlife. So I've tried to have a, f a full um, life cycle go on. In fact, in the back, there are the images of a pomegranate flower in the magic lantern slide. Yes. And it's actually a Dutch painting with flies all over the ripe fruit. And that is a Vanitas painting. Wow. This, thank you. This one's called Thou Leavest Me. And it's a cactus flower. And I guess because of its prickly notions, it, it would like people to leave. What I've used here in the background design are Aztec um, stylized cactus patterns. And, and the circle around the, the cactus flower also has that protection prickly message around it. And what I have on the, the cactus is exploding with these little milagros, which are really um, ways of, of leaving an offering at a shrine for a right. prayer. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it would be um, either healing a foot or going on a trip. So I've got Thou Leavest Me going on a trip. And in behind the magic lantern slide, I have two little legs walking away. And in the center of the flower, there's a little bird flying away from the piston there. Very nice. This one, the poppy, in the Victorian lexicon of flowers means oblivion. And I tried to really go with that opium poppy feel. So I have some pods that are being pricked for heroin in the background. I have um, the, the realistic poppies that I've, I've uh, done from photographs that I had taken. And they're layered on top of this beautiful Suzani pattern of a, of a very stylized poppy that they used in Turkey. And what I loved about this is that the leaves, the black curvy leaves, they reminded me of a scorpion tail. So I have that element mm -hmm. there, um, a loose association of, of, of danger and poison. And I also have this uh, wire going through that's bent in the shape of a coma brainwave. Really? Pattern. Yeah. Coma <laughs> brainwave. So you looked that up and did the research? Oh, yeah. No, I, I have to live with them for a long time. I think and let my mind drift in different ways and see what comes up. And now this is a different style. Very yes. Nice. Oh, you know, in the spring, I'm a very bad driver because I'm so torn by all the beautiful oh. orchards that we have, the Be remnants careful. of them. I know. Well, this was a, a tree that I found in Monte Sereno, and it was just in full, beautiful flower. Normally, I'm attracted to the old dying trees that have a lot of character. But this one reminded me of the Pablo Neruda poem, Every Day You Play, and there's a line in it. I want to do with you what spring does to cherry trees. And oh, so I yeah. painted a series of very sensual cherry blossoms. Yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and this one that's behind <laughs> us, let's take a look at this. It's enormous. This, this one's called Blooming Deadwood. And 
The story behind this one is that on Blossom Hill Road near where I live, there's a series of beautiful, beautiful trees that are blackened with age. And every spring I think, oh, it's not going to bloom this year. It's not going to bloom this year. So finally I said, enough of this. I've got to take this picture. Right. So I, my son was in the stroller, and we went down this busy road because you can't really even walk on it. And I just snapped the photo, and I painted it in my studio. And then the following spring it didn't bloom. Oh. And then the following spring following that they cut it down. And I guess why it's poignant to me is because my grandmother was also struggling at the end of her life at this point, and with a lot of grace and dignity, and that's what this tree was. Uh, it has, it means for me that there's beauty and strength and grace at any point in life, mm -hmm. and a lot of, I just find um, beauty is a lot more poignant when it is fleeting, and I, I try to work that into a lot of my paintings. Yeah, that's definitely obvious. So you are a Silicon Valley Open Studios artist. I am. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you feel the benefits of being an artist in the Open Studios oh, is? Oh, wonderful. It was such a great experience last year. You know, apart from all the promotion that they do for right. you, I went ahead and um, I did my own mail-outs for my client list. I had um, a wonderful article written about me and my work that went into the Mercury News. Oh, good for you. And the local papers. So I got a lot of people. I had a couple of hundred people coming out on that Mother's Day weekend. Very and nice. I had four of my girlfriends helping me. And I had this beautiful studio. It's like a Victorian greenhouse. So it's oh, got nice. a clear story, tons of light. And it opens up into a garden. So I had my paintings everywhere. I had refreshments and it felt like a party. So it's an opportunity for the community really to come in and see what's going on, what you're doing, to get to talk with the artists and find out about the work and what we're inspired by. And, and it, as an artist, it's a really wonderful opportunity to find out how people respond to your work. Yeah, and how did you get the article? Very briefly, tell us. Oh, well, there's, um, you can let people know what you're doing. So. I let the newspaper know that this was coming up, and I read a, a short little um, couple paragraphs about what it is, and if they're interested, they'll call you back, okay, and they'll send nice. over a photographer, and uh, yeah. Get the whole thing. Well, it's, excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on Talk Art. You paint the most beautiful floral paintings, and I really like the history and stories that you tell. Thank you, Sally. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, and thank you for watching Talk Art.